Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and today we're visiting with Gerald McDermott, uh, who is the Anglican Chair of Divinity at Beeson Divinity School here in Birmingham, Alabama. However, we're speaking to him remote. Uh, he's in my hometown of Pittsburgh visiting family. Gerald, welcome to the program. Thank you, Rabbi Walker. Uh, Gerald is the author of a book entitled Israel Matters, Why Christians Must Think Differently About the People and the Land. Now, you're an Anglican priest. Uh, you came up through the ranks of the uh, Anglican world. Uh, at what point in your walk did it become stunningly clear to you that the Israel, that the God of Israel and the people of the book and the land of the book are the heart of the book and the 2,000 year approach to Israel as uh, a divorced entity and as a replaced entity in God's economy uh, has become the prevalent thought of almost two billion Christians who are reading their Bibles and saying, boy, I can't wait because Jesus is coming back to redeem me and Jesus is coming back to redeem Israel and the restoration of uh, and fulfillment of the oldest prophecy in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, that talks about the seed of the woman, Jesus, and the seed of the serpent, uh, the Antichrist. And so he's coming back to Israel. He says in Matthew 23.37 through 39, I'm not coming back until you Jerusalem, Israel, the Jewish leadership call for my return, but yet we have the predominant view that when Jesus died on the cross that the Old Testament was yesterday's diapers <laughs> and is being treated as such. How did you immersed in uh, predominant New Testament thought, predominant Greek mindset. How did you come to this revelation? Well, Rabbi Walker, that's uh, or can I say Rabbi Eric? You can say that's anything you want. That's a good question. Um, it started twenty years ago. And I had been trained as a supersessionist, and you, and your audience probably knows what that means. The the view that you just described, that the church, mostly Gentile, has superseded Israel right. or replaced Israel. I had been trained in it, in 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 all the scholarly work that I've done over the last forty years. Uh, I've been trained in it, and I uh, I just you know didn't think twice but that the church is the new Israel and 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 has has so so that mo mostly Gentile church has replaced uh, the Jewish Israel and then I started going to Israel about 20 years ago and that's when my views started changing because I was giving lectures to tour groups that I was leading in Israel and I had this brilliant young uh, tour guide who lived in Israel who uh, uh, is somehow related to Messianic Jews his yes. wife is Messianic Jew okay uh, his wife is Israeli and he started to gently privately um, question some of the things that I had said very courteously 
and I started doing some research. And that was 20 years ago. And actually, you you know, uh, you probably know Rabbi Eric from from reading Israel Matters that that the book is really my story. Yes. Of of, of <laughs> how I moved being a classic supersessionist to what I call the new Christian Zionism today. Well, first of all, a heartfelt thanks from a Jewish man who came to faith in the Jewish Messiah. Uh, I was raised in the synagogue. I came to faith in the synagogue. I was born a Jew. I live as a Jew. I'll die as a Jew. The concept of conversion is not biblical. You did not have to convert to Judaism to believe in Jesus, the yeah. Jewish Messiah. The thought that I would convert to something is preposterous. Jesus was Jewish. And sure. everything was done in accordance to the law. And I'll take it even one step further to tell you that traditionally, academically, the last three words of the Bible of the, the last three words of the Old Testament, uh, you would probably turn to the book of Malachi. The traditional Jew would turn to the book of Chronicles, Second Chronicles, and I turn to the cross, where the last three words spoken were, it is finished. Mm. And those, to me, are the last three words of the Old Testament. Mm. And when you put it in that context, because there was no mm. New Testament at the time of Jesus, when was the law fulfilled? What are the last three words of the Old Testament? It, it, it is finished. Mm. When we say that God is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Greek mm. mind just accepts that as an absolute. The Hebrew mind says, of what? He's the beginning of what? He's the end of what? He's the first of what? If it, first and last are ordinal, meaning if there's a first, there has to be a second. You can't have a first and a last without something in between. So the idea of alpha and omega beginning and end, first and last, I have to ask the question as a Jew with a Hebrew mind that says, he's the first and last of what? The beginning and the end of what? And the answer is the sacrificial system for sin. And he began it in the Garden of Eden, and he ended it on the cross. He brought the first sacrifice, and he replaced the man-made garments with the garment of righteousness of his own provision to cover the sin of Adam and Eve that they might maintain relationship with God. And he brought the last. So the first and the last, the beginning and the end, from my Jewish mind, this is how I see the text. And to those who promote this replacement theology concept, I have to ask them the question, if God could break his covenant with Israel, what makes you think he couldn't break his covenant with you? And you stand on John 3.16 as a covenant statement. And it is framed as a covenant statement. That for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whomsoever would believe in him, that's the covenant, that he brought his son, and if you, on your side of the covenant, believe in him, then the covenant is fulfilled with eternal life. It's a covenant. Mm -hmm. Was he joking? He wasn't. God's not a bigamist. God is not a proponent of divorce. God says clearly in his word, I betroth myself to Israel. And we have this teaching that Jesus is coming back for the bride. Paul spoke these words that the church is the body of Christ. So does the groom marry the groom? <laughs> And uh, you, 40 years in academia, 
with this long line of hundreds of years of writings about how the church has replaced Israel, come to this revelation because you're getting provoked, because you're getting asked questions, because we're, we're questioning people. We take nothing for granted. We're going to question, and a Messianic Jewish tour guide, I probably know which one it was. Uh, I know many of them. I'm there every year. Uh, and 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 take groups every year uh, would cause you to rethink and go back to the scriptures. And what you've done in your story is this is the scriptural evidence, the argument for why Israel matters and the other side of it, it answers the question, why they matter so much and why they should matter so much to the Christian. Because not only are we to protect the oracles of God, we've been charged by Jesus himself on a day memorialized as Palm Sunday in Matthew 23, 37, speaking to a very distinct group of people saying, I'm not coming back until you, very specifically you, and that you, Jerusalem, was the Sanhedrin who had rejected him a year and a half before when they accused him of casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. And that Sanhedrin is made of 70 plus 1, which is a very important number as Joseph was 1 plus the 70. And mm -hmm. as we begin to look all the way through Scripture, we see this structure. And so there has to be a new Sanhedrin. There has to be a high priest in place. There has to be this leadership. And you clearly make an argument of what I do for a living and that is taking the message this Pauline call to say you have to put it in perspective you have to understand that clearly it is the great commission not the great omission <laughs> it is to the Jew first and we spent 2,000 years looking at this Romans 11 statement that God gave the gift of salvation to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to envy, and we've got half that right. I've yet to meet a Christian, and I'll ask you this, Gerald. If all the Jews at the time of Jesus had accepted him as Messiah, where would 2.6 billion people be? Would they matter? Would they be in or would they be out? Well, when you say 2.6 billion, I, I assume you mean Gentile Christians. Correct. And um, as I understand Paul's mind in Romans 11, and uh, he was... He was agreeing with what the rabbis were teaching that when Israel accepts what that when the Messiah comes and Israel accepts the Messiah yes. the world will yes. come to an end so those 2.6 billion people would not even exist uh, and but now you now this is the way I interpret it and you might disagree with me um, Paul is saying that God sent a partial hardening upon Israel for the purpose of opening up space and time for, for Gentiles to be saved. And that at some point in the future, uh, that time of the fullness of the Gentiles will come to an end, and the, and the partial hardening of Israel will also come to an end, Yes, and Israel will accept her Messiah as he says, all Israel shall be saved, which, which means not every single Jew, but, but a great vast majority of the bulk of Jews uh, of that day.
I, I mean, that's how I interpret it. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, that's what I uh, wrote about very briefly in the book. Uh, uh, and, and the book is mostly about other things. Right. You, 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 the case you make in the book is that Israel matters. And here this past week, the Mennonite Church uh, added themselves to the list of boycott, divest, and sanction. Presbyterian Church USA, uh, remove mm. Israel from all prayers. Uh, the Catholic Church has clearly stated uh, from their very beginnings, uh, from 300 AD on, uh, that they are the center and the core and that, that the ownership of, of even access to God himself must go through them and that Israel is, uh, um, they broke their covenant and therefore they lost their inheritance. To make it very clear, it was God himself that initiated the covenant with Abraham. And we go back to Genesis and we read that Abraham was instructed to take, to take the animals and cut them in half and God was going to pass through and confirm his covenant. And the Genesis 15 borders of Israel, biblically mandated Israel, were established and God initiated that. That land is the covenant land that is what the grafted into the Abrahamic covenant is this relationship with God in that land. The condition for the enjoyment of the land is entirely different than the covenant promise to the land. Meaning when we broke the laws of Israel and God dispersed us, he wasn't nullifying a covenant he said would be for all time everlasting eternal covenant. He's just saying as he sent the message through Moses your enjoyment of the land is conditional upon your obedience. Your title to the land is unconditional. There was no condition put on it by God. God initiated it with Abraham and for Abraham's descendants, including those that are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. The scriptures read from Genesis to Revelation, not from Matthew to Revelation and then back, but from Genesis through Revelation, talks about Israel's role and how Israel matters in this entire assessment. Your argument, and I want to talk about uh, where the teaching originated and as you've become aware more scholars have become aware. Why is there still an underlying or really predominant thought process that the church has replaced Israel? Why is that, why is that a still growing thought process? Uh, yeah, uh, Rabbi Eric, uh, uh, let me answer, or try to answer that, but first let me just comment on two things you, you just said. Uh, first, I, I, I like the language you used about, and, and in fact it's the very language I, uh, it's, it's almost the very language I use in this book, Israel Matters, that whereas the title to the land is unconditional, possession of the land, now, now now you use the word enjoyment of the land, and I think that's that might even be better. Uh, is is uh, now I'm sorry. 
whereas title to the land is unconditional. Yes. Uh, Israel's enjoyment or possession of the land is conditional. Correct. And and that's the language I use in the book. Uh, although I think your 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 word enjoyment might be better. Um, secondly, the Catholic Church uh, in Vatican II uh, in in the document Nostra Aetate, uh, the Catholic Church renounced one half of its previous supersessionism. It said we were wrong to say or to imply that God broke his covenant with the Jews uh, and replaced his covenant with the Jews with the covenant with the church. We were wrong to say that. God is still in covenant with the Jews. Now, the Catholic Church has not yet, you know, renounced the second half of supersessionism, uh, supersessionism which has to do with the land, but I, I've been in communication with uh, Catholic theologians at First Things, uh, the, base, the Catholic Journal on Religion and Public Life, which is probably the best read journal in America on religion and public life and widely respected. And I'm a member of Catholics and Evangelicals uh, together. And some good things are happening amongst Catholic theologians. Uh, and I would just say, that a majority of the ones that I speak with feel very strongly about the land and and uh, are beginning, I think, to write publicly about the importance of the land for God's covenant. But, but to answer your question about uh, why, why it is that the church for most of, of uh, well, that the church in the 20th century and now in the 21st century, most of the Christian church is still supersessionist. I, I mean, I think that's your question. Yes. And my answer would be that most of the church is still supersessionist because it has been taught that way and has not been given a credible alternative. The only alternative it, it has seen has been in dispensationalism, and most Christian theologians despise dispensationalism. They think of it as uh, uh, lousy th um, theology and lousy exegesis. Now, I, I don't agree with them. I, um, you, know, I, you know, I have a lot of admiration for the academic dispensationalists who had the courage uh, to, to say things that no one else was saying. And basically, dispensationalists, uh, you, know, you know, saw things way back in the mid 19th century that just about no one was seeing. Uh, I'm I'm not a dispensationalist myself. I don't agree with dispensationalism, but but at least, um, but so the new Christian Zionist movement, which which I'm a part of, is trying to say to the world of theology and to the church that. Zionism is at the heart of the New Testament, not just the Old Testament. And the reason why we haven't seen it is because we've been trained not to see it. So that's my basic answer to your question. The church uh, has been supersessionist because it's been trained to see only supersessionism in the Bible and has never heard a credible academic or exegetical argument against it. And we hope to change that. Well, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very, very encouraged to hear that. We're talking with Gerald McDermott, author of Israel Matters, Why Christians Must Think Differently About the People and the Land. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to dig into some of the concepts presented here that you may have never heard but they're right there in your Bible. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program, Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatia Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries 
with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.inbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www. Dot ianbn .com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Gerald McDermott, author of Israel Matter, Matters, why Christians must think differently about the people and the land. Gerald, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Rabbi Eric. Uh, Gerald, you self-admittedly share that your training and the training of the seminaries around the world continue to perpetuate uh, the thought that the church the bride, has become the bride, that uh, Jesus is coming back to redeem the church and that Israel's part 
uh, was complete and when they rejected the covenants of God and broke the law of Moses and were dispersed that their position and place in God's economy was now replaced by those who accepted Jesus. You were provoked and challenged and questioned in Israel by a Jewish believer that knew the Hebrew text, that knew that all the things that were fulfilled at the time of Jesus were exactly as he said in Matthew 5.17, that he didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill it. And that law was for the purpose of atonement, forgiveness of sin, relationship with God. You took on a project which would distinguish you among your peers as one who is either a heretic, a rebel, or has stumbled across a 2,000 year old error and is doing what he can to correct the error. How is this being received in the academic community? Well, uh, it's a little too early to tell because books, you know, this is actually my second book. My first book is called The New Christian Zionism. Okay. And there I get together with nine other New Christian Zionist scholars. Uh, well, mostly scholars. Um, and that came out a year ago with University Academic. Uh, most of the reviews so far have been positive, a few have been negative, um, but you know, academic books take a long time to, to be reviewed. Now this Israel Matters is not an academic book, it's, right. it's, uh, I wrote it specifically for people in the pews, uh, and I think it's very accessible and easy to understand. You don't need any theological background, I don't think, to understand it. Um, um, it's so I'd say, uh, you know, so far uh, the reviews have been more positive than negative. There have been negative reviews of both the academic book, the New Christian Zionism, and this popular book, Israel Matters. Um, and uh, you know, there are some seminaries that are very that that already have been teaching things similar to this like Dallas Seminary yes, and, and some of the Southern Baptist Seminaries um, and Beeson Seminary where I teach. Uh, you know, uh, there are other f uh, faculty at Beeson who hold views similar to mine. Now, not all of them do and, and, and I haven't actually asked them but, but uh, we're probably divided on these things. Um, but most of your you know your other seminaries, in, including most of the evangelical seminaries, are 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 typically supersessionist. I, I agree, and the average person in the pew, ninety percent of the messages that they hear are drawn from the New Testament, uh, and the focus is on. Jesus, and in many ways, God, the Creator, God the Father, has been replaced with Jesus, mm, and good point. Good point. we seem to forget that even Jesus himself said, when you pray, this is how you are to pray. He alluded several times, if I asked my father, he would dispatch a legion of angels, meaning what was written in Psalm 91, that I command my angels about you. God had authority over the angels, even Jesus. In that statement says, I don't, I don't have authority over. He makes a statement, I don't even know the time of my return, only my father knows. There are many deferential statements made by Jesus including that in the end everything will be subject to the Father, including the Son. 
so we've kind of allowed a quote unquote Jesus only framework into almost a replacement theology of its own that the God of Israel has been replaced with the incarnate God. And we talk about a trinity or triune or compound unity, but Jesus did not come to the earth with a plan. He came to fulfill the Father's plan. It was God's plan of atonement. And one of the questions I have for you is, is this issue of Israel just symptomatic or one of the symptoms of us putting the Bible into a perspective that it was not intended to be placed in, which is the focus on Jesus? Well, well, you know, that's a good question. Um, I would say the Bible clearly teaches the Trinity. And what you're getting at, I think, is, an, is a somewhat unbalanced view of the Trinity that has prevailed for many, many years, um, where it's only, a, as you put it, um, a Jesus-only Trinity. Now, of course, you know, Pentecostals have rightly tried to restore focus to the Holy Spirit, but... You know, I was talking to another theologian recently, an, an Anglican theologian, you know, thoroughly orthodox, who uh, who remarked to me, he said, you know, Jerry, hardly anyone writes about God the Father anymore. Right. Almost every book is about Jesus. And, you know, more and more books about the Holy Spirit, but, but whatever happened to God the Father, in fact, that would be a good title, mm -hmm. whatever happened to God the Father, <laughs> that question mark. Um... And I think that's that's a part of what you're getting at. That um, uh, our our God is the God of Israel, who is Trinitarian, but He's the God of Israel. Yes, and He's the Father. And and as you rightly said, Rabbi Eric, you know Jesus is always pointing to the Father. Now he now he also points to me, you know, um, to Himself, but as the incarnation of the Father. When 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 you see me, he told his apostles, you see the Father. And uh, and the kingdom, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, will revert to the Father. It's the Father's kingdom. It's, it's not Jesus' kingdom. Right. It's the Father's kingdom. And Paul says that explicitly in, in, in uh, uh, well, 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 Jesus refers to it in Matthew, and Paul says it explicitly in 1 Corinthians 15. So, yes, um, uh, you know, uh, the Trinity is always getting out of balance in the history of uh, theology. And these days, uh, we, we have lost proper focus on the Father and, and the fact that the Father is the God of Israel. Well, the other thing we've done is... And I'll go back to that oldest prophecy of the Bible, Genesis 3.15. We've embraced half of the prophecy, and we teach nothing about the other half of the prophecy, which is of equal value, which is the seed of the serpent, which is the coming of the Antichrist. So our avoidance of eschatology, our avoidance of talking about end-time prophecy, our avoidance of... Uh, either saying, well, we're not going to be around. Well, who's going to be left around? If all the Christians are taken out, who's left? Uh, the mm. Jews. Mm. <laughs> oh, so we have to suffer because we rejected Jesus. This is more in line with that anti-Semitic thinking that God's punishing the Jews for rejecting him. God mm. says, I'm going to return the Jews to Israel in unbelief. This is my plan. I'm going to bring them back to the land. They're not going to believe in me. I'm going to bring them back in unbelief. They are going to be a secular nation. Why are you shocked? I told you I was going to do it this way. But because you don't pay attention to my plan, you only look at the words of Jesus and you don't understand the big picture, mm -hmm. you're looking at one 
strategic component or one tactical component of a strategic plan. I'm giving you the entirety of a strategic plan in the entirety of the Bible from Genesis 1 to the end of Revolu Revelation. And Israel is a part and parcel to both the strategic and the tactical. And this partial blinding, I did that. I did it to get you to come in. I did it to make a place for you. I made a place for you by putting three, three Gentile women in the genealogy of Jesus, of Jesus. I did it in a mixed multitude when I delivered you from the hand of Pharaoh. I always made a place. As a matter of fact, the fallen nation of Moab generated the one who ushered in the line of David I've always had this master plan, but if you don't see that it involves Ephesians 2, from the two I shall make one. It's not from the one I'll show. Uh, we have to exist, and we have to play our part as God designed it, or there cannot be one new man. It cannot happen. You cannot take one plus one and make one. It, it is the, uh, it's one plus one. Uh, separate people to become one people. Mm. We look at the prophets mm. who tell us everything about this final encounter in Isaiah. I looked upon one whose garments were stained with blood and, and I asked, what's the meaning of this? And he said, I had to fight them myself. I had to defeat the armies myself. There was no one there to help me. And I had to bring salvation, Yeshua, with my own right hand. Meaning Jesus is going to come back when he's called and redeem Israel. And Zechariah 14 is the victory march. It's the victory ascent up the Mount of Olives. It is the renovation of the earth to accommodate a thousand year reign in a temple described in Ezekiel that's so magnificent, so large, we can't even conceive. And we don't even talk about the change in geography because it's so monumental. They call it end time prophecy, but it's not end, it's beginning of the millennial reign. And, it, and somehow or other, we lost the vision that the Bible is not 66 books and 40 some authors. The Bible, if you believe the Bible, says that all scripture is God breathed. Therefore, there's one author. And there's one book. There were 40 some scribes in the Hebrew mind, Sofer, a scribe, we understand. Look, the book of Jeremiah does not record every word that Jeremiah ever spoke. It's not an autobiographical sketch of Jeremiah. It is what God said through the prophet Jeremiah to the king about what was and what is and what is to come. Therefore, God was the author. It didn't matter who wrote it down. It was by the hand of Moses, it was by the hand of Joshua, it was by the hand of Jeremiah, it was by the hand of Matthew, it was by the hand, but the author was God and it's one book. And when we start a book in the middle or we pick and choose what it is we want to apply, what we do is we misrepresent the author. And Israel matters Israel is the epicenter. Israel matters so much that this is where Jesus returns to. This is where the demonic hordes are dispatched again for the second time in history. When you look at demonology, we don't know a whole lot about demons from the Old Testament other than the fallen angels, and then we don't read much more about it until Jesus is born. And then all of a sudden, excuse my language, but all hell breaks loose, and all the fallen angels come to the ground as demons, 
and they're all engaging Jesus in the three and a half years of ministry. Come to the book of Acts, they go away. We don't talk about demons again. Paul never talks about them until we come to the book of Revelation, which is the return of how do you kill, how do you cut off Jesus? There's only one way to do it, and that's kill the Jews. Because it was through the lineage of the Jews that he would be born, and through the lineage of the Jews that he will return. So if you want to get a commutation of your death sentence, you get rid of the, what, key witness. The, you don't have the star witness at the table. They can't convict you. And so this anti-Jewish, anti-Israel theology at its core is anti-Jesus. If you are not for Israel and the Jews, you're actually, as a practicing, believing Christian, anti-Jesus. Because he does, Mr. and Mrs. Christ didn't have a little boy named Jesus. He didn't come back. He didn't come to create Christianity. He's not coming back to increase Christianity. He's coming back to fulfill the prophecies of God and the restoration of mankind's relationship and the defeat, the final fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And your book should be required reading. There should not be anybody that's ever given the title pastor or teacher of any seminary that doesn't understand the fundamentals of this because the churches stand against Israel and the churches stand with boycott, divest, and sanction is actually anti-Jesus. He was a Jew. He is a Jew. He is coming back to sit on the throne of the temple where there will be no Ark of the Covenant. There will be no sin offering because he was the sin offering. But there will be daily offerings and there will be feast offerings and there will be observance of the Leviticus 23 God's appointed times. It's not going to be high mass. It's not going to be anything different than Davidic praise and worship in a Levitical liturgical environment according to exactly what God tells us is going to occur during the 1,000 year reign. Tells us that through the prophet Zechariah. Tells us that through the prophet Ezekiel. And your book truly addresses some of the fundamental misunderstandings. And I appreciate that so much. And you put yourself out there. You know, when I made my profession of faith, I put myself out there. I had to be willing, willing to lose 14 million relatives. Are you teaching this at Beeson? Is this something that's part of the curriculum now at Beeson? Well, I, um, I teach all sorts of courses at Beeson and, and frequently in, well, all my courses involve Christian theology. And so for me, when I talk about Christian theology, I, I, I have to bring in Israel. And so I, I, bring in uh, all sorts of discussions of Israel, the God of Israel, and what this means in uh, um, for us as a church and for the world in in various discussions and various courses I teach. But, but you know, Rabbi Walker, um, uh, one thing you mentioned was, was very interesting to me. Well, all of what you say is very interesting, but one thing in particular, uh, uh, when, when you talk about anti-Semitism, yes, 
in history and anti-Semitism today and, and its relationship to Israel. Uh, uh, um, at the very end of this book, I say that Israel is a clue to what Paul calls the mystery of iniquity. And he also refers to the mystery of Israel. And so my argument I make at the very end, toward the end of the last chapter, in fact, I think it is the very last point in the last chapter. It is. Is that the mystery of Israel is the key to the mystery of iniquity. In other words, uh, you know, sin is iniquity. Sin is irrational. <clears throat> and, and why is it that all through history, the world has tried to destroy Jews and 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 to destroy Israel. It wasn't just the Holocaust. I mean, Holocaust was six million Jews destroyed. But through the history of Christianity, I mean, the church, uh, you know, Christians, uh, in the name of Christ, tragically, sadly, yes. demonically, have murdered Jews, probably over a million Jews, even before the Holocaust. Yes. Um, uh, why is that? Why is that? And I think it's because of what you were mentioning, that that Jews, well, as you put it so well, I never heard that before. Uh, Jews are the witness, and as you say in a murder trial, the uh, uh, you know the person who's trying to get rid of the murder accusation is going to try to get rid of the witness. Wow. Genesis 3.15, it's, it's so clear. It says, there'll be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the woman, uh, the seed of the serpent will, will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. So, God makes a declaration. Satan, you're going to die. Sentence is passed. Here is who your executioner is. Here is the method of execution. The only thing I'm not going to tell you is when. So you now know the who and you know the how. You just don't know when. Now, you put a man in prison and sentence him to death, he's going to begin to work on a stay of execution. He's going to work on appeal. So what happens? You enlist people who are going to cut off the lineage. He goes to Pharaoh. Kill the boys, you don't have a line of Israel. Didn't work. Goes to Haman. Haman who happens to be a descendant of Esau, whose vision was to annihilate Israel. Okay? He fails. Herod. Herod's lineage. He's an Edomite. He's a descendant of Haman. He's a descendant of Esau. He goes out and tries to kill and it doesn't work. Now everything happens according to God's word. Jesus dies but dies in accordance with the Levitical system and is resurrected. So Satan says, aha, I have another chance. I hear the proclamation on the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem, you're not going to see me again until you cry out, aha, I got another chance. So he goes out and he gets himself a Hitler. And he gets himself an Ahmadinejad. And he gets himself <clears throat> a Mohammed. And he gets himself a well-meaning white Anglo-Saxon Protestant American worldwide Christianity that says that those Jews, they rejected Jesus. They're, they killed Jesus. They're the ones that crucified Jesus. And we need to boycott them. We need to get rid of them. Well, sure, you get rid of the Jews. We can't call for the return of the Messiah. Satan wins. It is a 6,000-year-old strategy. It is, to me, so simple, so clear, and... Bob Dylan, Jewish believer, writes, you got to serve somebody, you either serve the Lord or you serve the devil. If you're not serving the Lord and stand with Israel and the Jews, you're actually against Jesus and against his return. And your hope is gone. And to me, it's, 
it makes no sense. Now, of course, I'm Jewish, raised Jewish, look at it from a Hebrew perspective, in a Hebrew mind, it becomes obvious. You've been sentenced to death. Here's how you're going to die. Here's, here's, here's who, who's going to do it. You just don't know when. You go about and see if you can't thwart the whole process. And if you can, then, hey, you can rule the world. You're the prince of the earth. And it's just that simple. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. Daryl, I want to have you back on uh, when you're in town. Sitting in this seat right here, I want us to continue this conversation. There's 90 things straight out of Torah that I want to tell you that will take you so, make you so convinced. Right now you're convinced, but I'm going to turn you into not just a Christian Zionist, but I'm going to turn you into a Christian Zionist zealot. <laughs> right, where you're going to be as passionate about this whole idea and understand this master plan and help me bring the world to an understanding of why the Jews matter, why Israel matters, because it's all about Jesus. See, this is all about Jesus. The church wasn't supposed to be all about Jesus. This is all about Jesus and the coming back and the return of the Messiah. Thank you for being with us. Tell Pittsburgh I said hello. Uh, go buy uh, the original hot dog for me and uh, go buy all my old haunts and let them uh, know that, uh, say hi to my mom. She's right down Fifth Avenue. <laughs> well, thanks, Rabbi Walker. It was great to meet you and hope to see you in person. Thank you so much. God bless. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. We'll be right back.